so I'm a bit of a physics geek, so I decided to do mine on the Higgs boson because there was a lot of news about it last year, and I still didn't really know what I was talking about. Um, my background's mostly in chemistry and nuclear physics and other things, and um, we never have to really even deal with uh, these kind of particles. So uh, we've got the Higgs boson. The obvious thing is this is Peter Higgs. He kind of developed it, uh, the theory around it in 1967, uh, and then we just uh, confirmed it uh, last year. And basically, little quick things you need to know, know about bosons is that they're elementary particles, they're subatomic particles, and they have integer spin, which means 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And this will actually come into importance later. Okay. So this is the standard model. These are all the particles we knew about um, basically before the Higgs boson. Then we have to add that one here. Um, and the ones that you mostly come in contact with are the photons, you know, any type of light. Uh, we've got uh, quarks, up and down quarks. These are the only ones that exist in uh, nature. They make up protons and neutrons uh, and electrons. So pretty much everything in the known universe that you come in contact with are uh, those three particles on the left. Okay. So we always hear that the Higgs boson gives <coughs> particles mass. And um, uh, that's really not that crazy of a concept when you come to think of it because we've known about this for years and years and years. So uh, if we look at protons, protons have two up quarks and one down quark. Um, so if you see up quark has a charge of plus two thirds, you know, so times two is four thirds. Subtract one, uh, one third there, and you actually have a plus one charge. Uh, neutrons are the other way. So you have negative two thirds plus two thirds, and uh, you end up, end up with zero charge. So the reason I bring this up is that, uh, like I mentioned, two ups and a down, and the proton itself we know is about 940 uh, MeV. That's just how you measure mass. But if we actually add these up, we get uh, about 10 MeV. And we know that that's, that's way, way lower than what we observe. So it's about you know 1% roughly of the actual mass of the proton. So where does the rest of that mass come from? It actually comes from E equals mc squared, where we know it all. Um, E equals mc squared is actually the rudimentary version of that theorem. Uh, it's kind of dumbed down with uh, Walter Matthau uh, there. <laughs> but uh, actually, the original form is this. So it's e squared equals mc squared plus pc squared. So this is the full Lagrangian, which takes into account uh, kinetic energy. So e equals mc squared is only for particles at rest. So we found that if we have things that have a lot of uh, uh, energy, the particles then have mass, and that actually makes up 99% of the mass of the proton. So what does this have to do with the Higgs boson? It has nothing to do with the Higgs boson, and that is the point. Uh, um, I also love wasting people's time, but the point is that there is mass that, that is just generated, um, that we come in contact every day. It, it creates gra gravity, but has nothing to do with the Higgs boson. The Higgs boson is what creates that other 1% that we can't uh, account for. Okay, so why do we need the Higgs boson? We need the Higgs boson is because math is hard and math is really freaking hard. And if you're studying for your doctorate in math, you might just give up and come over here because it is that hard. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, so here's, an ex here's like a s sample physics problem that you see all, all, all the time, uh, like in you know, high school physics. You've got a massless, unstretchable rope that goes over a massless, frictionless pulley without slipping and uh, so forth. And if you eliminate all the other variables, it's not that difficult of a problem. If you have to take into account every one of those variables, it becomes now a huge uh, problem and just takes a lot of time and becomes a lot more uh, complicated. So why this is cool is that we know that some of these particles already don't have mass. And we, we understand these ones uh, really pretty well, photons and gluons. Gluons mediate the strong force. They hold photon, uh, protons together. And we know a lot about those. And we also know that the other particles that we know a, a lot about, the up, down, the uh, up quark and the down quark, are very light. And 99% of their mass doesn't even come from particles. It comes from energy. So we're just like, well, what if we just eliminate that other 1% and pretend it's zero? And it's basically then the math became so much easier. And if everything was, mass, was massless, we would be so happy and we could just add mass in later. And then uh, stuff would start making sense. We could start build uh, 
really good uh, predictive models. Okay. So why this is important, uh, going back to the first slide, is that I said that bosons have integer spin. Uh, everything else has half integer spin. And the cool thing about that is that uh, things with half integer spin have to obey the Pauli exclusion principle. Okay. So the Pauli exclusion principle just means that things of the same energy can't occupy the same space. Um, so it's kind of like if you're paying, playing Jenga. So if all of these are actual particles, you can't have this block have more than one particle. It can only have one block in it. Um, the same is also true if you, if you take out a block, you're actually leaving a hole and you could put one back on there together. So that's how most matter uh, works, except for bosons. They don't have to obey the Pauli exclusion principle. So the cool thing about that is that you can remove a block and the block is still there. They all kind of uh, occupy the same space. You can also add a block to where there already is one and uh, you're not affecting anything. So this is actually uh, what's called a Bose-Einstein uh, condensate. So they started making these uh, back in the 80s so they could actually uh, observe what's going on. But it's really kind of freaky because you're just grabbing stuff uh, uh, out of the condensate and you're not affecting it in, in any way. Uh, so it, they're kind of like breadsticks at the Olive Garden. You, you can just, just grab them. I've never put one, I've never given one back, but uh, uh, just basically by taking them, you're not affecting the state in any way. <laughs> okay, so now that we've talked about condensates, I wanna talk about one example that we actually knew of uh, quite a few years before the, we found the Higgs boson, and this is what gives mass to the Z boson. Uh, Z boson uh, comes out what, uh, through uh, nuclear decay, beta decay, um, and you'll notice that it's uh, not charged um, but it does have a property that's very similar to charge. So it's similar to electrical charge, um, but it's obviously not, and it ha has to do with the Z boson. So we'll call this the zilch property. So uh, the interesting thing about it is that we noticed that these Z bosons were just kind of flipping from one zilch to zero zilch back to uh, one zilch and back again. And uh, that's actually what's giving its mass. So like the interesting thing is that it can't just it can't just do that. It can't just flip back and forth without uh, being interfered with with some other particle. And that other particle is actually called the Ziggs boson. So uh, uh, actually, I'm not making this up. Uh, um, this guy made it up. Uh, he gave a great lecture on the Higgs boson. Uh, it's on YouTube. Uh, this is Leonard Susskind from uh, San, uh, Stanford. Uh, the zilch is actually the electroweak hypercharge because it's not like charge. It's kind of like it. And the Ziggs boson is really the Goldstone boson. Um, and it, you might know this guy because he got in the black hole wars with Stephen Hawking, and he actually, a lot of people say that he ended up winning him. So he's a pretty well-known uh, guy, but he's got a, a great lecture uh, on this. If you wanna watch the whole thing, it's about an, uh, an hour and 15 minutes. Okay, so going back to this is, uh, we've got these things that have one zilch, and then they're just kind of changing to zero zilch and back again. And the way that they do that is they, they're actually absorbing a breadstick and then emitting a breadstick that goes back. And the neat thing about this is that since they are actually bosons, you're not, you're not affecting the pool in any way. Just by grabbing these things out of uh, thin air, you're not changing any uh, uh, state. You're not leaving a hole in the breadsticks by absorbing and uh, remitting them. Okay, <clears throat> so now let's look back at uh, the whole uh, model. Um, we knew that this happened for the Z bosons because they have to do with the electroweak hypercharge, that weird zilch property. But we know that other stuff has mass and it doesn't explain that. So that's why we basically needed these because these don't have the electroweak hypercharge. They just have charge and they still have mass and we still have to figure out what's going on. Okay, so uh, he theorized this other uh, type of field called the Higgs field, which would actually interact with some of these uh, particles um, while actually not interacting with some of the other ones. So anything that's massless, uh, mainly just the photon and gluon right here, um, you'll notice just don't interact with them at all. There's no connection to the Higgs. It does connect to uh, like electrons, quarks, and the bosons, and it actually uh, um, can interact with itself and give itself mass. So um, the, the Higgs is a, is a very kind of uh, difficult concept to, to talk about, so they held a, uh, a contest. I think this was TED last year as to who could give like the best explanation of, about the actual Higgs mechanism. And they sent it in and they actually made a little uh, uh, animation for it that I'm gonna play now just to kind of uh, explain how the mechanism itself works. Suppose there is a large cocktail party at the CERN laboratory filled with particle physics researchers. 
This crowd of physicists represents the Higgs field. If a tax collector entered the party, nobody would want to talk to them, and they could very easily cross the room to get to the bar. The tax collector wouldn't interact with the crowd in much the same way that some particles don't interact with the Higgs field. The particles that don't interact, like photons, for example, are called massless. Now suppose that Peter Higgs entered the same room, perhaps in search of a pint. In this case, the physicists will immediately crowd around Higgs to discuss with him their efforts to measure the properties of his namesake boson. Because he interacts strongly with the okay, crowd. Yeah. So this is basically the Higgs field, and all these guys are the breadsticks that are just kind of going back and forth. So it's not, it's not a perfect analogy because we'll actually see changes in the field based on them uh, aggregating, whereas um, this would be treating them if they were like fermions rather than bosons. Okay, so another analogy I like to give is if the Higgs field was a mob of teenage girls. So you just have this mass of, of teenage girls and you've got to pass through them somehow. Okay. If you have one of the stars from the Hunger Games, say, you know, Cadness Pride or uh, uh, Pita, it would be pretty massive. They would have a bit of a difficult time going through. If you have uh, one of the members of the cast of Divergent, They'll still have some difficult time going through, but it's, it's like the Hunger Games light. Um, and then if you have glittery, uh, glitter, glittery abstinent vampires, they're going to be super massive. They're all going to go crazy and aggregate around. And uh, the important thing is that we also know that things like Led Zeppelin or Black Sabbath <laughs> or anything good or of cultural significance just pass right through. So um, the reason why there was so much excitement over this is because um, people say that it completed the standard model, you know, that, those list of particles that we had. Uh, it didn't really complete it because we could always find new stuff and there's a lot of stuff which it still doesn't explain. It just made the model consistent with itself so they could see how uh, the things we already know about, how they interact. Um, uh, you know, of course, it shows how elementary particles get their mass, like we know how uh, protons get their mass uh, uh, through other ways. Um, and the cool thing is that it doesn't actually fit in exactly as we predicted. If it fit in exactly as we uh, predicted, it would be really, really boring for science because we'd be dumb. We would have solved science. Um, but there's a lot of things which it, it is slightly different than uh, the way we theorize, which means that there's other stuff we have to actually um, uh, start accounting for and stuff that we never would have had any idea unless we could actually observe the Higgs boson and see um, how it kind of broke down. So. That's why, why it's exciting, because it proved people right, and it also has some other weird stuff going on that we'll just uh, have to keep um, uh, theorizing about and uh, going forward. Well, that's it.